Hello, and welcome to show number 2314 of Eyes on Success, a weekly program covering a wide variety of topics of interest to people with vision loss. I'm Nancy Goodman Torpy. And I'm Pete Torpy. I'm constantly busy. Everybody says, don't you ever stop working? I said, no, I love what I do. I don't want to stop writing until I die. And today's guest has really written some fun material that you'd be interested to hear. We'll talk with Mark Carlson about the books he's written, primarily a pair of memoirs from the perspective of his guide dogs, but also about his other passion, military strategy. But first for our tip of the week. This week's tip comes from Mark Carlson. Life today is chaotic, hectic. And it is more and more fast-paced, and it sometimes scares me how fast things are going and how much change takes place. The COVID uh, pandemic was a terrible time. I lost my wife during that, my wife, Jane, of 25 years. But I continued on if that's what she wanted me to do. And I believe that while it did bring out the worst in some people, it brought out the best in others. There are some wonderful people out there, and I have been so blessed to know people who have not only been friendly and kind and generous, but who have gone out of their way to help this weird, funny, blind guy with a beautiful dog. And I want to thank them all very much. There are a lot of good people in the world, and we are blessed to have them around us. But they are the ones that will give the world It's best, and they are the ones that will save the future for us. Support for Eyes on Success is provided by Insight.org, N-S-I-T-E dot O-R-G, and Insight U, providing accessible on-demand and virtual instructor-led classes, programs, and workshops to support career skills training and professional development for individuals who are blind or have low vision or are veterans. Insight, a vision for talent. You are listening to Eyes on Success. Success, 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 success. Let's start by meeting Mark. My name is Mark Carlton. I live in San Diego. I'm 62, and I'm a writer, an author, a magazine contributor, and lecturer. I am totally blind. I've been blind from about the age of 39 from retinatic pigmentosa. But I also have two other disabilities. I would always say I have three disabilities. I'm, I'm blind, I'm hearing impaired, and I'm a guy. <laughs> but that has not been a, an issue. It's, uh, my abilities to do things has always increased, and I've been very blessed to have some incredible friends and a wonderful support network that have helped me accomplish so much that being blind hasn't really been anything more than a challenge to me. And as far as I'm concerned, that if I hadn't gone blind, I would never have gotten my wonderful guide dog, Musket and then Saffron. As far as I'm concerned, being blind was a blessing. And I have gotten so much more out of life and the world has been more colorful and beautiful than mere eyesight ever could have. And I understand you're not the only member of your family who's blind. That's correct. Uh, It is hereditary. My father, my older brother, my father was born in 1917, had retinitis pigmentosa, and uh, he did not have anywhere near the advantages that my brother and I have. So he left that to me. He didn't leave me any money, of course. But I got the retinitis pigmentosa and his bushy eyebrows. He He was a wonderful role model. He didn't let this stop him. He was an engineer for GTE, Sylvania, for 30 years, and he could do pretty much anything. So I had a wonderful role model to follow, and my brother, too. And you yourself were a graphic design person for many years with limited vision. Yeah, that's true. It's funny that even though my parents knew that I was likely to go blind in my adult years, my love for art was something that they encouraged. And I think they were sort of hoping that I would become a millionaire before I was 40. 
uh, I'm still working on it. And uh, I was a portrait artist and an artist, and I did a lot of historical scenes, which was my real passion. But uh, I was a computer graphic designer when my site really started to fail. And I struggled as long as I could, but I finally had to, to give it up and turn to writing instead. Well, you know, very few people know this. We record these interviews in Pete's study, and he's got the Braille display, and usually the monitor is off. And on the wall are some drawings that he made in high school when he could still see a little bit, and he was actually pretty good. I figured a career in commercial art wasn't in the cards for me, though. So when it came to taking either advanced commercial art or calculus in high school, I headed towards calculus and... I had a career as a physicist. <laughs> I hung on as long as I could, and computers did make it possible for me to extend my art career long beyond where it might otherwise have failed. And I still have a lot of my painting and artwork in my house. And I remember every one of them very well. I have a very good visual memory. So even though I can't draw them anymore, I can't paint, I can still see them in my mind. So now I paint with words instead. Eyes on Success is made possible in part by our corporate partners. Underwriting pairs the impact of targeted marketing with the integrity of community goodwill. Learn more by sending an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. This week's focus topic is Mark Carlson's life and the books he has written about his guide dogs, as well as his other passion, military strategy. Well, Mark, if people hadn't captured this in the introduction, you certainly have a positive attitude towards life and blindness and your situation. And one of the things that impressed me in reading one of your guide dog books was you talking about sighted people having five senses. And even though you were blind, you in some sense had five senses too. Although you didn't have the sense of sight, you had the sense of sound, touch, taste, and smell, and you also had the sense of humor that helped get you through situations in life. Yes, you've got to have a sense of humor just to live in the modern world, but I've always had a sense of humor. Uh, it's somewhat warped. Um, I'm a little twisted about that and whimsical, but I've learned to laugh at myself, and I've learned to laugh at at things and not take things so seriously. My outlook on life has become much easier going. I don't quit the small stuff. And I found that when I would do lectures for uh, my previous job as an assistive technology specialist, and when I would do lectures for people, I usually started out with something funny, as I just said, about having three disabilities. That usually broke the ice. And I made use of my guide dogs as well um, because it helped people to relax. Disabilities are a hard sell. They're, they're kind of a, an uncomfortable subject for a lot of people. And this way, you can get the message across that you're not going to be hard-nosed, you're not going to be pedantic or anything that makes them uncomfortable. I like to laugh at it, and I always say that, you know, I'm not going to be offended by blind jokes unless it's funnier than the one I came up with. <laughs> And that attitude certainly comes across in the books you've written about yourself and your guide dogs. Can you tell us the names of those books and a little bit about them? Yes. Confessions of a Guide Dog, The Blonde Leading the Blind is the first one. And that was actually my first published book. My first dog, Musket, came from Guide Dogs for the Blind and I, in um, April of 2002. Uh, he was such an incredible dog, a big, big loving, easygoing yellow Labrador, and people just fell in love with him. And as time went on, as the years went on, I, I started remembering these incredible stories, these things that happened with him. He just made things happen. And I started writing them down. And eventually I realized that there was a book there. And unfortunately, my timing was terrible because when I finished writing Confessions of a Guide Dog, uh, it was right after Marley and Me had come out. And there wasn't a publisher in the world that was going to touch another dog book because they were being bombarded by them. So I 
kept struggling and finally got it published and I wanted to tell the story. I wanted it to be heartwarming and humorous and emotional and and also a little bit to explain people. And a lot of people have said that they learn so much about how guide dogs are trained and how they work by reading that book. What I thought was particularly interesting about the book was in the introduction or in the prologue, you sort of talked about that it was written by you and Musket. And Musket appears quite a bit back and forth in conversations with you in the book. Yeah, um, that's not an original idea. But uh, I wanted Musket to have his say because one of the things my wife and I did um, was we spoke Musket's words. He had so much character that we would say, hey, Musket, you want to go for a walk? And Musket would say, well, yeah, it's about time. I've been standing here by the door. What are you, blind or something? Things like that. And we, we did that. And so I kept that in the, the book character, what Musket would have called spin control. Just, um, I'm not really confessing anything except that I have a fetish for treats and belly rub. So on things. So uh, he came to life. And through that book, he's still alive. He's still very much in people's minds. And he had an incredible fan club, of people all over the world that had fallen in love with him. I'll bet he sounded like a gem of a dog in that book. Mm -hmm. And I gather after he retired, you got another guide dog and wrote another book from the second guide dog's perspective. That's right. Well, Musket was uh, starting to show his age in 2011 and slowing down somewhat. After 10 years of work, decided it was time to retire him and let him live on his laurels. He could enjoy his 401k9 plan and his uh, golden retriever parachute. And so we uh, decided to retire him, my wife and I, and he would get to be a dog. So I went back to guide dogs in September of 2012, and I was given Saffron, another yellow Labrador, a female. It was a bit of a, uh, how would I say, it was... A slow and strange uh, progression, but I went from having musket to saffron, which was like driving a beat up, beat up old VW microbus to getting a Formula One racer. And I had to learn everything all over again. But saffron was a true lover girl, and she true made everybody love her. And so after about eight years, and about the time that my wife died of a heart attack in 2020. I had started writing down Saffron stories. So that became the second book, which I wanted it to be a sequel to the original one. It's called Confessions of a Labradiva, Another Blonde Leading the Blind. And it's written in the same format with Saffron speaking her role. But it starts at the point where Musket retired. So there's still some overlap of Musket all the way through the point where he died and Saffron became the sole guide dog. So it was a real life-changing experience. I had these two incredible dogs. Stefan is just beloved everywhere, and she's going to retire later this year, so the number three coming up soon. And your writing style is very engaging in terms of exploring and telling about some of these stories and adventures, and it's far from being a very dry just description of what's going on. It, it really is entertaining. I like it to be entertaining. I want my readers to enjoy it and laugh at it. What I say is that I want them to smile at the victory and uh, shake their heads at the absurdities. It's life. It's real life. I think people have not only learned a lot about what it's like to be blind, but learned to respect people who have disability even more. And if that comes across, if it helps that, I consider it to be a job well done. I want people to feel comfortable about it. And and they um, meeting Saffron, going to the store, or wherever I am, and some of my veterans meetings and so on, I'll have to meet with people and they say, can I meet your dog? And I say, sure, thank you very much for asking. And, and they just fell in love with her. She's very well known. That's the best thing. They're like little ambassador dogs. And it's a very strong partnership between the uh, guide dog owner and the dog. And that's a very special relationship. Yeah. Uh, the dog that saved my life more than once. Much gets saved my life three times that I know of. 
and maybe a couple others I never found out about. Tell us about one of the more memorable times that that happened. Well, the simplest one would be when he refused to step into an open excavation, and I didn't know it was there. I kept saying, forward, forward, and he just refused to move. <laughs> and finally, I got it through my thick head that something was there, and I got down and I felt around. There was no street, it was just a big hole. And I said, good boy, <laughs> good boy. He, uh, he backed me away from a moving car more than once. Yeah, he, he was very quick to react to that kind of thing. And of course, they're trained to do that at Guide Dog. He and Saffron have done really well in their job. And they've both given me an incredible amount of mobility and independence uh, in the places. I've been all over the country for my lectures and book signings and so on. Well, in fact, you talked about how well-behaved they are. A number of years ago for the show, we interviewed a person who was training guide dogs before they were given to the prospective person who was going to use them. And one of the dogs she had actually failed. And the reason the dog failed was because it was too obedient to its owner when some danger came along and the owner told the dog to keep going. It kept going rather than just stopping, which, you know, in your situation, falling into that pit would have been exactly the wrong thing to do to obey what you wanted the dog to do. Yeah, they are trained what is known as um, intelligent disobedience. and they're actually trained to resist an order if they consider it dangerous. It's an amazing thing. These dogs have to be very intelligent, but they also have to use their heads. Musket and Saffron have done well at that. In some cases, they're much smarter than me. I've gotten lost. There's been a few times when I really took the wrong turn and went somewhere I didn't expect to end up. And I say, okay, Saffron, take me home. Okay, Daddy, come on. And shake me right back home and say, well, I don't know how I did that, but thank God for her. That's better than Google Maps. <laughs> Much better. Of course, it always caught the treat. It's worth it. <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely worth it. Yeah, it's, it's COD. I get you home safely, you give me a treat. Deal? So when I was first doing research into you, I started looking up some of your books. And the first books I found were a lot of books on military strategy and firearms. And I thought that, wow, maybe you were in the military at some point and you had gone blind. But I learned differently after reading your books. You want to tell people your story there? You actually applied to, for the Marines in the 80s sometime, right? Oh, yeah. I tried to join the Navy in 79 and the Marines in 81. But it was actually my hearing that kept me out, not my eyesight, because at that time, I still had pretty good eyesight. I wanted to be in the military, very much. I wanted to be a Marine. Hoorah! Uh, but it, it wasn't in the cards. And instead, I became a Civil War reenactor. So you managed to scratch that itch. And then eventually, professionally, you were a graphic artist for a number of magazines that were about firearms and the such, right? Well... When you say firearms, obviously anything having to do with military history involves firearms, but not specifically. I write about battles and campaigns, and uh, I started out writing about aviation history, military aviation, and, and eventually spread out into military history in general. I've written, I don't know, I've lost track, around 200 articles for a lot of national magazines, and I've written books about military history and so on. Yeah, uh, I'm fascinated. I've always been loved history from Civil War on, and something my mother encouraged me to do. She really instilled a love of history and reading. And because of audiobooks, I have an unlimited amount of reading that I can do for research. And of course, with using JAWS on the computer, I can do research and I can scan books into my computer and read them as well. So there is no limit to the access I have to resources to learn and write. And that's what I truly love to do. And that's primarily my source of income is to, is to write articles and books. I'm working on two books right now about naval history and about the Pacific War. It should be out later this year. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. So you managed to scratch some itches of your interest, have a really interesting professional career, and some fun dogs. Yeah, well, 
the, the one book that seems to raise a few eyebrows, even though I've never seen them, I just know they're being praised. It's when I was a, uh, I was a docent at the San Diego Air and Space Museum, I was a tour guide. When they would say, Mark, we have a tour group that needs a guide, and say, I'd show up with musket, and you could just hear the silence, and these, this blind guy is going to be our tour guide? And I said, yes, my name is Mark Carlson. Welcome to the San Diego Air and Space Museum. I will be doing the talking, and my guide dog, Musket, will do the walking. And then we start going to the tour. And he knew his way around that museum very well. What other topics have you written about? I also wrote a book because of my other love with old movies. I wrote a book called Flying on Film, A Century of Aviation in the Movies, 1912 to 2012, which features uh, 176 different aviation theme film and a blind guy writing a book about the movies. Hmm. Well, it worked because I knew these movies so well and I was able to do the research and I interviewed hundreds of veterans, actors, astronauts, and so on to write the book. That's the odd one in the mix. Well, you sure do keep busy. I'm constantly busy. Everybody says, don't you ever stop working? I said, no, I love what I do. I don't want to stop writing until I die. Well, that's perfect. If you love what you do, that's more than many people can ask. That's really a great thing when you can enjoy doing what you're doing. I think I've always been lucky because when I was a graphic designer, I had tangible results of what I did. Whether I created a piece of artwork, production art, or a magazine article, or an ad, or something like that, I could see the results of my work. and I, That was satisfying. The writing is the same way. When I get a couple of copies of the magazine in the mail, I can't see the article, but I know that it's in there, something I wrote, and I've added to the historical record. I take my writing very seriously. I think it's something that I'll be able to leave behind after I'm gone. People will be reading my work for years to come. You are listening to Eyes on Success. 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 Now for this week's final item, how to learn more about and how to obtain Mark Carlson's writings and how to contact him. Well, Mark, if people are interested in finding out more about some of your books and actually getting them, remind us of the name of the Guide Dog books and where they can get some of your other books. Well, uh, the Guide Dog book were published by iUniverse. And they're called Confessions of a Guide Dog, The Blonde Leading the Blind by Mark Carlton and Musket. The second book is Confessions of a Labradiva, Another Blonde Leading the Blind by Mark Carlton and Saffron. The Marines Lost Squadron, The Odyssey of VMF 422 is available uh, in print and in Kindle um, for, uh, excuse me, uh, Sunbury Press. The um, Flying on Film, A Century of Aviation in the Movies, 1912 to 2012. It's the perfect book for anybody uh, who loves movies and aviation to sit there with that book next to them. And uh, my my newest series that I'm most proud of, that I just finished my first novel, my first published novel, is called Vengeance of the Last Roman Legion. It's a four-part series that took me 14 years to write. And the fourth part was just released by Sunbury Press uh, in December. And it is, it is being recorded for BARD, for the National Library Service. They will be doing them this year. So by the end of the year, all four of them should be done. And that means blind and handicapped will be able to read them. Just like they can read Confessions of a Guide Dog and Confessions of a Labradiva are both available on BARD. The Marines Law Squadron is available on Audible. I put my contact information to you so you, people can contact me. Uh, if anybody would like autographed copies of the book, they can contact me. Or if they just want to talk to me, I like hearing stories. And I love hearing from people who want to write and want to explore writing and need any advice on how to get published or how to start writing a book. I'm always glad to talk to them and help. That's very kind of you. How would people reach you if they want to reach you? The best way to reach me is by my email, and it's markcarlson2222 at outlook.com. And that's M-A-R-K-C-A-R-L-S-O-N 
2222. Mark Carlton, 2222, no spaces, all lowercase, at outlook.com. I do have a website, but it hasn't been updated in some time. It's called musketmania.com. And there's more information on there. So we'll include links to many of your publications, but do you have those listed on your website or somewhere else? Not on the website. Uh, they're actually in the books, um, my publication, but I write for American history, aviation history, flight journal, World War II history, World War II quarterly, World War II magazine, naval history, military history, military heritage, EAA warbirds, and a bunch of others. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> yeah. So if you just Google my name, um, you'll usually find a lot of my articles and so on. If you find my name and it says wanted dead or alive after it, just ignore that one. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. Is there anything we missed? I also am a, a public speaker. I was a member of Toastmasters for several years, and I was the president of my Toastmasters club here in um, San Diego. And I do lectures for groups called um, OASIS, O-A-S-I-S, which I believe means older adults. Student Information Services. And I do a lot of lectures on many historical subjects. I think I'm up to like 65 different topics right now. You look up OASIS and also Continuing Education Center of San Diego. They also do Zoom lectures for anybody across the country can join these Zoom lectures and um, listen to my lectures. I have ones on the Titanic and the Hindenburg and the Palomar Telescope and the Apollo program and the Bounty and the Civil War and many, many different topics. In case you missed any of that in the audio portion of the show, you can always find it in the show notes associated with this episode, which is number 2314 at www.eyesonsuccess.net. You know, we're always interested in hearing from our listeners. If you have any comments, suggestions, or ideas for future shows that you'd like to hear, just send us a note to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. That's it for today's show. Next week on Eyes on Success, we'll be talking with Scott Chessworth. Scott is a blind music producer who also offers mixing and mastering services for his clients. And also tutors and trains others in those skills. And we will actually explain the difference as well. But we'll talk with Scott about his journey into music, his passion for working with others, and his commitment to making music accessible for people with disabilities. So thanks for joining us this week, and we hope we'll catch you next week for that episode. You've been listening to Eyes on Success, hosted and produced by Nancy Goodman Torpy and Peter Torpy. You can access the full archive of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, and much more by going to our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. If you have questions about anything you've heard on the show or have suggestions for future shows, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.